following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today's lecture is entitled The Consciousness. And as has been our trend over the last few weeks, we're going to continue our discussion of Gnostic psychology. And as a reminder, as we've mentioned many times, Gnostic psychology is a really precise uh, form of science and philosophy and mysticism. It really has all three. We always need to remember that the term gnosis is related to direct knowledge. And psychology relates to the psyche which of course is the soul in Greek. And ology or logos is the word, or in other words, God, or the creative impulse, that which manifests. So in studying Gnostic psychology, really what we're trying to understand is the direct experience of our own soul in relation to that which is divine. In that sense, we can't take Gnosis or Gnostic psychology at the superficial level. Gnostic psychology is really something that has profound depth and has to be understood in a precise manner. Now, the axle or the foundation upon which Gnostic psychology uh, depends, is a proper understanding of this word consciousness. Because in any spiritual tradition or mystical tradition, or even in philosophy, there's a lot of discussion of consciousness, or mind, or the self. And the purpose of religion, or spirituality, is to realize that self, to know that self, or to have gnosis, direct knowledge of that self. So from that foundation, then it becomes obvious that we need to know what that self is, what the consciousness is, and what the mind is. Our common interpretation or definition of consciousness has to be revised. Because we do not have a proper understanding of what consciousness really is, we suffer. Truthfully, you could say, the cause of all suffering is ignorance of consciousness, or ignorance of self. And so, by coming to know the self, or know what the consciousness is, we begin to free ourselves from suffering. Now, what we commonly think of, or we uh, 
conceive of as consciousness is what we would call the vigil state. We feel that when we are in what we call the vigil state, or we are active physically, moving about physically, that that is uh, our consciousness. And we are conscious when we are doing things, when we're physically active, when we're living our lives from day to day. And while in Gnosis we understand that that is an aspect of consciousness, it is not the definition. What we call the vigil state is in reality merely a state of consciousness related to the five senses and to the brain. In uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, they call these the six forms of consciousness. And these are the six sense contacts and thought. But in Gnosis, we understand that consciousness itself is not limited to this experience that we call the vigil state. Consciousness exists in every atom in nature. Any given atom, any given particle, has three aspects. It has matter, it has energy, and it has consciousness. So, from that point of view, we understand that all of nature is alive. All of nature has consciousness in its level. So consciousness is a vast depth and also has vast heights. Those depths and heights are illustrated in what we study in Gnostic psychology as the two lines of life. We have the vertical line, or the line of being, which illustrates for us in a schematic way the many levels of being, or levels of consciousness. This is mirrored in the scientific or materialistic science related to the study of light. Even materialistic science, three-dimensional physics, we know that light has a great expanse of vibration from very slow vibrations, which we call infrared, to very high vibrations, which we call ultraviolet. And that expanse is huge. And we, as the organisms that we are, with the sense contacts that we have, only perceive a very narrow band of that light. And that's what we call visible light. But by using certain kinds of tools, we can extend that vision and see into other areas of the expanse of light. And we use tools like radar and sonar and X-ray photography in order to extend our physical sight into realms that we cannot perceive normally. In the same manner, the Gnostic psychologist or the Gnostic student learns how to utilize certain sciences, certain tools, to extend the range of their perception and access levels of consciousness which are not normally visible. And those tools are called meditation, they're called dream yoga, and other types of sense faculties. When you examine that, then you understand that really what we're talking about when we talk about consciousness, we're really talking about perception. All the varying levels of consciousness are really varying levels of perception. And in Gnosis, we understand that there are two primary definitions or two primary forms of perception, objective and subjective. By objective perception, we mean 
the perception of that which is real. To see reality as it is. And we have subjective perception, which means to see things as illusion, meaning that we see illusion and believe it is real. So subjective perception is really illusory. It is fantasy. It is not reality. So objective perception is really the conscious perception of objective or spiritual truth. And subjective perception is that which perceives but does not see truth. Between these two is an intermediate state. And that is what we call the astral world. And perception in the astral world can be either objective or subjective, depending on the level of consciousness of the viewer. And we're going to come back to that so it'll make more sense. Subjective vision is characterized by imaginary perception, by fantasy, by artificially evoked hallucination, by absurd dreams, by visions that do not coincide with concrete facts, or by the reading of one's own projected unconscious thought. So with subjective vision or subjective perception, we result with false knowledge, false understanding, false concepts, false ideas. Much of what we call science or religion, much of what we call truth, is in fact subjective knowledge. Or information or beliefs or ideas which have been based upon subjective vision. To reach objective vision, to see things as truth, requires that one is able to identify and recognize that which is false. To know what is subjective is required in order to then know what is objective. So there are four steps to reach and acquire real objective vision or real objective perception of reality. The first step, according to the Hindu model, is called sleep. Sleep with dreams. Or sleep, actually, just plain sleep, deep sleep. And the second is sleep with dreams. These two are states of consciousness. We have the first, which is just sleep, which is a very deep, very unconscious level without any awareness. The second is sleep with dreams, which means there is perception of imagery, of phenomena, but without consciousness. In Greek, these two levels have very interesting terms or names. The first is called ekasia, which is spelled E-I-K-A-S-I-A. -I -I Plato used this term, and he used this term to describe human imagination, which perceives fantasy or that which is illusory. So, ikasia is really the vision or perception of illusion, but taken as reality. 
and it corresponds to the deepest levels of the sleep of the consciousness. The second level that we've talked about so far is sleep with dreams. And this is in Greek called pistis. And pistis is a term that is very difficult to translate into English. It relates to the mind. It sometimes is translated as faith or trustfulness or wisdom. But it is, like Ikasia, a quality of perception. And in this case, uh, pistis is related to beliefs, ideas, theories, things that we take for granted. So it's another level of illusion, but something that we believe in more concretely. It is nonetheless subjective. It's part of our subjective vision, or our subjective way of perceiving phenomena. Humanity as a whole exists mostly in these two states, and that's it. So we can say that humanity is asleep, because these two levels of consciousness are a form of sleep. What we have within us are human consciousness. We call the essence in Gnosis. In Buddhism, they call it Tathagatagarbha, which means the Buddha nature. And in Zen, they call it Buddhatta, which means the same thing. This essence or consciousness is really an embryo. This human consciousness that we have. But unfortunately, 97% of that human consciousness is trapped in subjectivity. That 97% is trapped in mental formations. And those formations are all ikasya and pistis. They are levels of our own interior consciousness, which are subjective and illusory but we believe that they are real. That leaves us with 3%, which is available to be free of that illusion. But unfortunately, we've not learned how to use it. So that 3% also sleeps. Gnostic psychology, then, is the study of these two portions of our own human consciousness in order to understand how to awaken the 3% that's free so that it can perceive objectively. And then how to free the remaining essence from subjective formations in the mind. And by that action, we awaken the totality of the consciousness and we become free of suffering. Which, of course, is what every creature wants, is to not suffer. So in order to achieve that, to awaken that essence, we need to understand the two other steps. The third step, after pistis, in Greek is called dianoia which is D-I-A-N-O-I-A. -I -I now this is the true vigil state. We as beings who are trapped in our subjective vision believe that pistis, or the second step, is our vigil state because we're up and active and aware and doing things. But you notice that we call this level sleep with dreams. And that's because, even though we may be active physically, as a consciousness, we remain dreaming. Because all day long, we're daydreaming. We're fantasizing. We are interacting with subjective elements in our own mind. 
And that is a form of fantasy. And that is not reality. So that is a form of sleep. When one learns to break that and to achieve the true vigil state, one is working with dianoia. Now in Greek, this term dianoia means thought or reason. But this is not the subjective reasoning of our animal mind. It is rather a form of conscious or objective reasoning, which is a revision of subjective thought. It is a conscious form of reasoning. which seeks to remove subjective reasoning or to transcend it. And the fourth step or the fourth level is called in Sanskrit Turiya, which is T-U-R-I-Y-A. And Turiya means pure consciousness, free of defilement, without any subjectivity at all. In Greek, it's called nous, N-O-U-S. And this is perfect objective perception. Nous in Greek really means intellect or reasoning. But it is pure objective reasoning, which is a capacity of the being. When we understand these four steps, and we begin to look at ourselves, to acquire that self-knowledge, which is the basis of Gnosis, it becomes evident that we really don't know anything about the third and fourth steps on this little chart. And that the vast majority of our time is spent enwrapped within our subjective perceptions of life. So the Gnostic student first has to learn how to activate their free consciousness, the 3%. And that's learned through knowing how to control our attention. Because the consciousness is the root of perception. That which has consciousness perceives. So by learning how to perceive consciously, objectively, we activate the free consciousness and we begin to acquire objective knowledge. That objective knowledge is to see the reality within us and around us without the filter of our own subjective point of view. This is difficult to achieve because 97% of our consciousness is trapped in subjective points of view, which is in truth a false sense of self. You could say, by extension, that 97% 90 of what we think, feel, and believe is false. Very few people are willing to accept that. Because we believe very much in ourselves. But Gnostic psychology teaches us that we need to undo that. We need to learn how to dissect our own mind with a scalpel of self-criticism, not self-hate, objective analysis, objective revision, which is dianoia, the third state. We need to learn how to utilize the free consciousness with objective reasoning. And in Gnosis, we call this self-observation and self-remembering. These are the critical practices which activate the free consciousness 
and give us the capacity to begin to see objectively. And to acquire that objective vision means that we begin to perceive ourselves as an actor on a stage who has a psyche or a soul which is trapped in desire. We have our external vents or that which is uh, arising around us. And then we have internal events or states, which is that which arises within us. We need to become aware and capable of perceiving both simultaneously and understand the relationship between them. Consciousness, which is pure perception, that's all it is, is the ability to perceive, has to be freed of the filter of the, of the subjective mind or the formations of the mind. And when it's free of that, it can perceive things as they truly are. Which means, as the impressions or perceptions of external events arrive, and as our internal states or internal phenomena arise, we perceive them as they are, not as we think they are. And this is a critical difference, subtle but critical. So from that point of view, we can see that there are, in reality, many different ways to perceive. We began by saying there are two primary ways, objective and subjective. But we can reduce this further, or actually we can expand upon it and see that objective and subjective really break down and become more levels. And they're important for us to understand. There are really five primary ways of perception. Five forms. Now, not too long ago, some people who wanted to hide this knowledge invented a term which they used to confuse those who were not initiated into these mysteries. They invented a term that they could use amongst themselves in order to further elaborate their understanding of the teaching. And that term is clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is from the French. Claire means clear or clean or pure. And voyance is vision. So clairvoyance really means clear vision, pure perception. Or in other words, conscious objective view. In its ideal state, clairvoyance is indeed clear. But in us, it is not. Our own perception is filtered. And we have varying ways of perceiving depending on which part of our own consciousness we're using. Because you remember, out of our 100% of that essence, out of that entire entity, 97% is trapped. So these five types are, the most elevated is supra-consciousness, or supra-conscious perception. This is a form of perception that is beyond, or supra, above, normal consciousness. And second, we have conscious perception. So these two first types we would qualify as the objective forms, or those which are not trapped or influenced by subjective elements in the mind. So the remaining three are the subjective forms of perception. And they include the subconscious perception, 
unconscious and infraconscious. Now, given that we have 97% of our essence trapped in the subjective formations within our mind, it means the majority of our perceptions of life belong to these subjective levels of consciousness. So long as we have not learned how to activate the essence, to use directed conscious attention, then we are, in fact, perceiving life subjectively. Which means we are taking our perceptions, which are illusory, as real. We are not seeing what is real. Conscious perception, the second level, is acquired only by those who have awakened the consciousness. That means those who have achieved awakening in the superior worlds, those who do not dream. Because a dream is a fantasy, and a fantasy is subjective. It is not real. Humanity lives asleep, both in the physical world and in the internal worlds. And until we awaken, we remain sleeping and interacting with our own subjective point of view. In order to really penetrate into the true and fundamental objective reality, we must not dream. Fantasy in all its forms has to end. Every true investigation into the mysteries of life starts there. So long as we're dreaming, we cannot perceive what is real. So dreaming must end. And that dreaming must end here and now. To activate the essence and to direct one's attention consciously begins in this moment. It does not begin tomorrow because there's no such thing. For the essence, for the consciousness, there is only now. Past and future are concepts that do not exist. The only thing that we can grasp and rely upon is the present moment. And on that foundation, the consciousness is awakened in the positive sense. It is necessary for every Gnostic student to awaken here and now in order to fundamentally and subsequently awaken in the internal worlds. And from there, conscious perception is developed. If we don't awaken in the present moment, here and now, within our physical bodies, we can never awaken internally. It's impossible which means we will remain dreaming and perceiving life in a false way. Therefore, we will suffer. Moreover, in order to know and verify that what we see is true, it must be supported by facts. So the Gnostic student who's learning to meditate who's learning to perceive life in a new way and to receive visions and to see things in meditation, must always remember every authentic, true vision is supported by facts in the physical world. 
always. If our vision, if our dreams are not supported by facts, we must doubt them. And the reasons why, we will discuss now. The 97% of our consciousness which is trapped results in a form of perception which is filtered or modified by formations in the mind. These formations have different structures. We call some of them aggregates or egos or defects. We call some of them representations. In truth, what we have is a collection of effigies or false creations which trap the consciousness itself. And those false creations utilize the powers of the consciousness to perceive. But each of those effigies perceives according to its own nature, which is subjective. So if you can imagine a collection of bottles and each bottle contains a spark of light or consciousness. But that bottle is colored glass. Some very dark, some very faint. But the radiance of that light is filtered by the quality of the glass. And thus it is not true. The job of the Gnostic student is to destroy those bottles. And each of those bottles is a mental formation. These formations are pride, anger, lust, memories, ideas, beliefs, concepts, theories, experiences. Every perception, internal or external, that passes in to the consciousness, into the mind, is received and has to be processed. But when our consciousness is asleep, when we have not trained our consciousness to be awake and controlled with directed attention, then those perceptions are received by the subjective nature of our own mind. Imagine an office whose responsibility it is to receive information. And in that office is a worker who takes that data and files it. The office is our own mind. And the worker is our personality. And that worker processes that information according to its own conditioning. It translates all that information in accordance with its own prejudices, its own beliefs, its own point of view, with its preconceptions. The organs of the senses take in that information. The mind the personality receives that information and stores it, but in the wrong way. For example, we go to a movie and we become very fascinated with the images, and with the story. We begin to receive all of the information from our senses. The, the images and the sounds. And inside of us, reactions are produced. Energy is transforming. The result of that mixture is a formation in the mind. If we're watching a movie that contains violence and we become fascinated and we don't know how to use the consciousness in an active, directed way. The imagery of violence produces a formation in our own mind, which is unconscious. 
meaning the consciousness is not there to receive it, the free consciousness. Rather, the trapped consciousness is there. The personality takes that data and stores it in the mind as formations. So we're creating new bottles. And those bottles have the qualities of that violence. It's stored information. Therefore, this element, which is an uh, entrapment of energy, exists within our own psyche as energy and matter and consciousness, but subjective. That energy needs to act. And it can only act in accordance with its nature, which is violence. So if the movie we were watching was a movie that had lustful situations, and we become identified with an actor, and we feel desire for that actor. That desire in the result ends in the result of a formation in our own mind, which is the energy of the desire for that actor. And that energy projects itself in the form of images. And those images will arise repeatedly in order to get our attention to feed it more because it's hungry. This results in daydreaming. It also results in comparing the other perceptions we receive with that stored formation. If we're married, we have a spouse, or we're looking for a spouse. Unconsciously, we are comparing the perceptions that we're currently receiving with the ones we've stored. We have desire in the in that memory or that formation of the actor or actress. We have new perceptions of our spouse or future spouse and unconsciously we compare and we are dissatisfied. Likewise, at night, we sleep, we dream and that formation in the mind projects its imagery. And so we dream about that actress or actor and we fornicate with that image. This is unconscious perception because we're not consciously controlling our attention. And the result is suffering because we have desires that cannot be fulfilled, so we feel unfulfilled. Likewise, we're investing energy into false ideas and false creations which seek more energy and want to be fulfilled, but cannot. These type of mental energy or mental images result in what we call unconscious clairvoyance or unconscious perception. This happens during the day and happens at night. And it happens in relation to all of the egos and mental formations that we have. We have formations related to self-hatred, to shame, to envy, to fear, resentment. All of which are formations that we've created based on perceptions that were unconsciously transformed, that were translated by the ego. And then those formations in the mind interact and call for energy and we become identified with them, and we suffer. The infraconscious levels are very submerged. These really relate to the very deep animal levels of our own mind. Cruelty, violence, deep sexual degeneration, nightmares. Nightmares are really simply the perception of our own infraconsciousness. Nightmares are real. They're real in the sense that those images exist within our own mind. They are images, creatures, 
that we ourselves have created because of wrong transformations in the past and because of feeding desires in the past. And thus, our own infraconsciousness is really our own deepest levels of hell, which is a part of our own soul, our own psyche, or rather, which our own psyche is trapped within. We have to descend into that hell, like all those great heroes of the past, to descend into the abyss, our own psychology, to retrieve the purity or that beautiful maiden who's trapped there. And that maiden, of course, is our own essence, our own consciousness. And we save that consciousness by destroying or conquering the dragon, that ego, that animal brutality and bestiality, which is within our own mind. Infraconscious perception is the result of those deep elements in the mind projecting their imagery and we become identified with them. People who become very identified with the sensations related to sexuality need to continue increasing the intensity of the sensations that they seek. Because we all know when you take a sensation, it's satisfying for a moment, and then it passes away, and we're no longer satisfied, and we want more. This is the nature of desire. And the more we feed that, the more we seek that sensation, the more dissatisfied we become. So we have to get more sensation and increase the intensity more and more and more each time. Little by little, step by step, we have to go deeper and deeper further and further, extending and exploring more intense sensation, more dangerous. This is how people are led from simple sexuality into the extremes of sexual abuse, into masochism and sadism, into homosexuality, into brutality. It's because of identification with sensation and a lack of understanding of what the consciousness is. The result of that is the expansion of infraconscious traps in the mind. And those images project themselves more and more. And the consciousness of that person becomes trapped more and more in those levels of the mind. And what happens when someone who's building a very strong infraconscious level is that they become a demon, inevitably. They're strengthening their own infraconsciousness. And that infraconsciousness becomes very aware and awake and active. And that's a tragedy. Now, the subconsciousness is that which is below our conscious awareness. Sub means below. Subconscious perception is closely related to the personality. It's related to the inheritance that we've got in our karma. This is what we call genotype, related to our genes. Our genes, which we inherit from our parents, is really the encoding of our own karma in matter. And that inheritance is both physical and psychological. We also have our phenotype, which is related to education. And this is all of those elements in our mind, which we have learned as we've grown. So related to genotype, with the personality and the consciousness, we have our race, culture, our situation with our family, our blood, our sex, our skin color, where we were born, what kind of family we have. With phenotype, we have the education we received, the examples we observed, the things we were taught, 
All of these things produce formations in the mind. Ideas, concepts, ways of behaving, ways of perceiving. Third, we have paratype, which is related to circumstances. And this can include the kind of circumstances we're surrounded by as we grow. Living in an area that's poor or an area that's rich. Having friends that are mean or friends that are lustful. A child goes to the movies and watches TV, and he is shown images of detectives and thieves. And he grows up filling his mind with formations related to crime. And he's shown on television how to commit crimes, what the thieves do, how clever they are, how smart they are, how attractive they are. And all of those elements are producing formations in the mind of the child so that when he becomes an adult, he knows very well how to commit crimes and get away with it. In the same way, the child learns how to fornicate, how to behave in a selfish manner, in a proud manner. These all remain within the subconsciousness of the child. And so later, as he faces life and faces many situations, those subconscious elements, without his conscious awareness, stimulate him to act. Those examples exist in his own mind and are there pushing for a particular kind of behavior. Our own parents teach us and pass on to us all of their own negative values in the same way. Our friends, our schoolmates, our co-workers. In any situation where we are not consciously attentive to the perceptions that we are receiving, we are forming more subconscious elements in our own mind. And those elements push us to act in accordance with their creation. So nowadays, we're watching television, and it's very popular to watch TV and see these comedies, which are all based on cruelty. Our modern humor is based on violence, on making other people suffer, humiliating others, criticizing others, making them feel bad being sarcastic, being cruel. And as we watch those television shows and watch those movies, we're producing more formations in our own mind which stimulate us to imitate. And therefore, later, with our friends and family and loved ones, we act in the same way and we don't even see it. Likewise, we read books and magazines and see movies and television shows which demonstrate to us all the supposed pleasures of animal sexuality, adultery, fornication, orgies, homosexuality, lesbianism, drug use, smoking, drinking, all forms of crime, thievery, robbery, lying. And we take all of that information, becomes mental formations, which then prompt us to imitate and act in the same way. And so long as we don't activate the consciousness and consciously question the impulses that arise inside of us, we will act that way. And we will remain unaware of it. What's necessary is for the Gnostic student to begin to examine all the impulses that arise within us. And at the same time, to receive all incoming phenomena with directed attention, to remain conscious, to observe actively 
our internal states and our external events. And by that observation, we can transform the impressions of life and cease creating false formations in the mind. When we learn how to self-observe, we're learning how to be aware of the observed phenomena and the one who observes it. This is called a division of attention. When we self-remember, we are aware that we are doing this. We're in our bodies, aware of being in the body and using the body, aware of sensation, aware of consciousness, perception. To be in self-remembering and in self-observation is 100% active. It is not at all mechanical, and it is not at all passive. It is an active form of perception. We may know, for example, that we're in a room, sitting on a chair, and listening, but that's passive. To actively listen, to really pay attention to what is being heard, and at the same time to be aware of all of the reactions that are being stimulated from moment to moment requires great activity of the consciousness. For that to happen, the personality has to be passive. Our own mental formations have to recede become passive. Directed attention is the key. Consciously placing our attention from moment to moment is the key. When that consciously directed attention becomes continuous from moment to moment, not just during the day, but even when the physical body is asleep and we remain consciously attentive, we have achieved and established ourselves in the third state of consciousness, which is dianoia. That is the establishment of self-remembering. And that is how one becomes the fourth type of personality, who is the one who has transcended the Tower of Babel, the lower three types, and is working to become the fifth. And the fifth, of course, is the one who has created the solar astral body. So in order to reach the development of the fourth type of person, to become established in the third state of consciousness, one has to be equilibriated. We must be in equilibrium, able to consciously direct attention and observe our three brains, the five centers. At the same time, we receive all impressions consciously, whether external or internal. That is to be in equilibrium. That is not yet to have conscious clairvoyance. That is the first step. We experience conscious clairvoyance when we reach the third state of consciousness, that active directed attention, because we begin to perceive objectively, but with limitations. And that's because 97% of our consciousness remains trapped in the ego. The goal is to establish conscious perception through continuous awareness, continuous consciousness. By that, we're reaching for supra-consciousness, which is a, a level of perception beyond human consciousness, beyond normal consciousness. A supra-conscious person is Hermes Trismahestas, Rama, Buddha, Krishna, these are beings who have 100% pure consciousness. 
That means no ego, not a single formation in the mind, completely pure. These are very developed forms of intelligence, forms of consciousness. Now every Gnostic student is working towards that goal. And to reach that, there are steps. What we're trying to achieve is that state of Turiya, that fourth state we talked about, which is that pure, objective perception. To reach that, we utilize self-remembering and self-observation. And dianoia, the Greek term for that state, implies intellectual revision of beliefs, concepts, theories, ideas. That is why Gnosis teaches spiritual, intellectual culture to have a very good and clear understanding of the logical and conceptual basis of all spiritual teachings. Gnosis teaches decency, refinement, logical analysis, conceptual synthesis, academic culture, higher mathematics, philosophy, science, art, religion. And Samael Anvior says, therefore in no way whatsoever are we willing to continue to accept the gossip of hallucinating people nor the madness of dreamers. This is what we have inside. Our own subjective mind hallucinates and dreams. The one who wants to achieve superconsciousness reaches that degree by eliminating from within themselves all that hallucinates and dreams. To become a supraconscious person requires that all dreaming and all fantasy must stop. There are four steps to reach from the third state of consciousness to the fourth. The first of these steps, we have to develop the ability to stop thinking. This means we need to achieve the silence of the mind. The achievement of the silence of the mind can never be reached by force. You cannot force the mind to be silent. What you learn is how to activate the consciousness. And when the consciousness becomes active, the mind is no longer overwhelmed with all the impressions that are being wrongly translated and thrown into it. And therefore that lake of the mind becomes calm. When the consciousness receives all impressions, no more impressions are being randomly thrown into the mind and thus the mind settles. Therefore, by learning to consciously direct attention, to concentrate, to pay attention, to relax, the mind settles on its own. And little by little, the student achieves the capacity to not think. When that is achieved, the Gnostic disciple then attains and develops the capacity to concentrate on one thing. To concentrate truly on one thing requires first that the mind is silent. The third level is correct meditation. This brings the first flashes of new consciousness into the mind. Now many believe that levels one and two are meditation, but they are not. They are preparation for meditation. The first level, properly called, is Pratyahara. 
also known as calm abiding. Dhyana, silence. The second level is called dharana, or meditation. But it really means concentration on one thing. And the third is actual meditation. And this is where we begin to really perceive and interact with the object that we concentrate upon. This is where we begin to penetrate its meaning. The fourth step is actual contemplation, or samadhi. The fourth step is Turiya. It is that pure consciousness. Now, it should be understood that as practitioners, we can taste these levels of consciousness. We may experience them, but that's not the same as to be established in them, to become one with those levels. Any Gnostic student can experience samadhi. That does not mean that they are awake. Unfortunately, people believe that to achieve the degree of Turiya is easy, that it can be done quickly. And people come into these studies and expect to achieve these things in a matter of weeks. That is, unfortunately, a subjective means of perception. To achieve purity of mind, to achieve pure consciousness, requires enormous effort and discipline. Nature does not make leaps. Everything in nature grows in accordance with its own development and its own needs. And the consciousness is no exception. To become a Buddha requires great effort. To become an angel requires enormous sacrifice. What we have to sacrifice is our own sense of self. That 97% which we ourselves have created and formed in our mind. All of that must die in order for something new to be born. The Master Samael on Vior has told us, in order to be that which we are not, we first must not be that which we are. We have to unbecome what we are now in order to become something better. Wishing and dreaming remains merely that a wish, a dream. The Gnostic student seeks practical, concrete reality. The Gnostic student who's learning about themselves and learning about life accepts nothing at face value. Questions everything. Believes and does not believe. The Gnostic student learns how to analyze all vision, all phenomena but to analyze from the point of view of consciousness, not theory, not intellect. Whatever arises is an illusion. Whatever we perceive is not real. From that point of view, knowing that perception is subjective, one can then reach the objective truth. But you cannot reach objective truth so long as you do not see subjective nature. 
And that subjective nature is within us. We see through colored glass. And until that glass is removed, we see falsely. And when we see falsely, we act falsely. And thus we act wrongly and we produce unfortunate circumstances, unfortunate results. The correct use of life and energy depends upon the correct perception of life and energy. The Master Samael Anvior, knowing full well that the knowledge contained within these teachings is terribly powerful, provided this knowledge with a warning. And the warning is this, do not accept things at face value. Every vision, every experience must be totally supported by concrete facts. We must be patient. We must analyze. We must be rigorous. Moreover, we have to purify ourselves of all misperception. He wrote in his book, The Perfect Matrimony, all Gnostic sanctuaries must exercise the greatest of vigilance to protect themselves against the spectacular pseudo-clairvoyants who from time to time appear on the scene to slander and discredit others, assuring us that such a fellow is a sorcerer, that such a fellow is a black magician, that such a fellow is fallen, etc. It is urgent to comprehend that no authentic Turiya has pride. Indeed, all those who say, I am the reincarnation of so-and-so, Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist, Napoleon, etc., are proud fools, misguided pseudo-clairvoyants, stupid fools. In front of the terrible and glorious majesty of the Father, we are nothing but miserable particles of dust, horrible worms of the mud. What I am stating in this paragraph is neither an allegorical nor a symbolic matter. I am literally and bluntly asserting a terrible reality. Indeed, it is the I that says, I am the master such and such, the reincarnation of the prophet so and so, etc. Certainly, the animal I is Satan. It is the I, the ego devil, who feels himself to be a master, a Mahatma, a Hierophant, or a prophet. This cannot be emphasized enough. The first time the Gnostic student begins to perceive visions internally, pride becomes a terrible obstacle. One astral experience can convert a sincere Gnostic student into an unbearable burden. One astral experience can be misinterpreted and become an obstacle. One clairvoyant vision can knock a student off the path. It is an absolute certainty that any sincere student who works with the teachings of Gnosis will access clairvoyant vision, will experience what it is to be awake outside of the body. And every student who reaches that experience must then comprehend how their own pride will seek to divert them. And many who do not. Many take all their experiences at face value and forget that all of the information, all of the language, all of the symbols of the internal worlds are symbolic. We may see ourselves as Moses that does not mean that we are Moses. We may see ourselves as a devil, and that may be true. But which are we likely to believe? 
Our pride wants to believe we're Moses, never that we're a devil. We may have an internal experience or a vision about someone who's close to us. But how do we know if that vision is just a formation of our own mind? We may be seeing the past. We may be seeing the future. We may be seeing a symbol. We may see our own spouse committing a crime and not realize that the crime was committed in the past or that the image of that spouse may represent another person. To properly interpret perception requires intellectual culture, knowledge of Kabbalah, self-knowledge, understanding of the laws that govern all phenomena. That is why Gnosis teaches decency, uprightness, intellectual culture, logical analysis, rigorous evaluation. Students are recommended to be very patient. Never accept an experience at face value. Wait. Compare your experiences with physical, concrete facts. Remember the laws that govern all symbolic representations, the laws of analogies, the law of correspondences, the law of numerology, the law of opposites. There are three levels in initiation, three levels to reach the state of Turiya. And these are imagination, inspiration, and intuition. By learning to meditate, by learning to travel outside of the physical body consciously, we're really learning how to perceive things in a new way, which is the proper use of imagination, or in other words, clairvoyance, consciousness. With imagination, we perceive new images. But often, we don't know how to comprehend or understand those images. The understanding comes partly through inspiration. We begin to see new symbols, new images. So first we learn to use the imagination to awaken the capacity to perceive. Then we receive new information, which is the level of inspiration. Moreover, going deeper, we receive the intuition, which is the understanding. All symbols, all visions, all phenomena must be interpreted coldly, without passion, without pride, without desire. Considering that 97% of our consciousness is trapped in desire, this becomes very difficult. We have to be extremely rigorous with ourselves. To have the intuitive understanding of our visions requires effort. It requires how to work, knowing how to work with our five centers, knowing how to work with our consciousness knowing how to understand the messages that come from the superior worlds. It does not come easily. And so we have to be patient. We have to question ourselves and question our visions. Many, many, many students of many schools fail because they do not know how to interpret what they see. A student can become an assassin, an adulterer, a murderer, a criminal by the misinterpretation of a vision. 
So it becomes important for us to remember that, to question ourselves and question what we see. Because you remember at the beginning, we explained the perception of all phenomena is divided into two camps, objective and subjective. And between them is the astral world, which can be either subjective or objective, depending upon the consciousness of the viewer. You may feel you're awake. You may be awake. But you may yet be perceiving unconscious, infraconscious, or subconscious images. So we have to learn how to distinguish the taste of those images. So that's our lecture. If we have questions, we will try to answer them. Okay. Can you tell more of the forming of the Kunda buffer when you are in a lower state of consciousness and the differences of the Kundalini when in higher states of consciousness? Okay. The question is about understanding the difference between Kundalini and Kunda buffer and higher and lower levels of consciousness. Kunda buffer in itself is the ego the energy of the ego, or that fire which is trapped in subjective nature. When we are identified with subjective elements in the mind, we are really identified with that fire, which is projected into the astral light and becomes imagery that we take as real. So the more we interact with that phenomena and take it as real, the more we develop that inverted fire of the Kunda buffer. When we enter into Gnosis, we practice transmutation and alchemy. We work towards the awakening of the Kundalini, which is the conscious or positive or positively polarized fire. And that fire is a direct extension of the Holy Spirit. That fire also illuminates the astral light. So it illuminates it in a positive way. That fire spins our chakras in the positive direction, which results in the reception of positive imagery. Anything else? Yes. How does Dzogchen, how is it related to the four states of consciousness? How is Dzogchen related to the four states? Well, Dzogchen is a Tibetan teaching uh, which is related to the direct and clear perception of reality. Dzogchen is a pure awareness school, which means that they teach how to be perfectly and attentively aware at all times. So in truth, you can say Dzogchen is really a form of gnosis, which teaches how to self-remember and self-observe. The third state. And through that, one reaches the fourth, which is Turiya. Any other questions? Yes. How do I get past the duality of the mind in order to use the scalpel of self-criticism? Good question. The duality of the mind is a result of the matter and energy of consciousness being trapped in subjective formations. Nature itself is dual. So the energy of our subjective mind expresses in the form of duality. Yes versus no, good versus bad, positive versus negative. The comprehension of that pendulum only can come when the consciousness is actively and attentively present. Meaning that under normal circumstances, when we are psychologically asleep, the mind is swinging on a pendulum between positive or good and negative or bad, which are really just states of identification, craving and aversion, seeking and avoiding. When the consciousness is brought into any given situation and we use directed attention in order to observe phenomena and comprehend phenomena, we bring the third 
state, which is in fact the Tao, or the center of the pendulum, that is the only thing that can produce the equilibrium of that duality, or the balance of opposing forces. In simple terms, it means be present, be aware, do not identify. Realize that whatever phenomena you are experiencing has its opposite. All phenomena arise and pass. Why become identified? If you're experiencing pain, it will not last. It'll pass away. If you're experiencing pleasure, it will not last. It will pass away. So do not identify with either extreme. That is how you balance the duality of the mind. Next. Is one of the reasons that we may see an object, person, or even a dwarf clairvoyantly in that particular form because we at this stage would not be able to understand what a light form is in reality, so the mind gives it a form? Yes. We perceive what we know. A man cannot perceive what he has not known. You cannot understand truth if you've not experienced it. So when we, in simple terms, that means that normally we perceive what we've already perceived. We can only perceive what we've formed in our own minds. And to extend beyond that is not easy to accomplish. An example would be when you go into your bathroom, you don't really see your bathroom because you've been there so many times that what you really see is your own formations about your bathroom. You're seeing projections. You don't see it for what it really is. That's why you can't find things. That's why when you lose something, you can't find it, because you're really reviewing the formations you have in your own mind and not what is actually physically in front of you. To learn to direct attention in the right way, means you really are starting to observe phenomena as they really are. And the perfection of that can lead you to look beyond that. Next. What is the relationship between samadhi and intuition in relation to the three steps of meditation, imagination, inspiration, and intuition? The three steps of imagination, inspiration, and intuition are really grades or qualities. They aren't like steps that you step up onto and then stay there. They're more like qualities that one passes through quickly or slowly. The same is true of, of the states of meditation like dhyana and dharana and samadhi. In any given moment in meditation, we have an active mind. We're trying to concentrate. Suddenly the mind may become empty. Suddenly we're able to concentrate on one thing. We penetrate the meaning of that thing. Suddenly we're experiencing something beyond our limited self. And just as suddenly we are back where we started. In that moment, we've passed through all those levels. Both on the chart of dhyana, dharana, and samadhi and on the chart of imagination, inspiration, and intuition. The charts explain qualities of those experiences. If in that moment we, we perceived, okay, we were concentrating on an event from the day when we became angry, and in our meditation suddenly we began to perceive a person we don't recognize in a situation we don't recognize. That's inspiration. And then in our heart we feel Oh, this is a symbol of how that anger causes me to behave. That is intuition. And just as quickly the experience can end. Does that make sense? Do you guys understand? So what's, it's like, you can have a hard time, you know, what's the difference between intuition and direct experience? It's almost like none. No, intuition is understanding. It's, it's the understanding of something. Right. But you can have intuition in different ways, in different forms. There are many levels. To have real, 
real intuition, you need direct experience. But that doesn't necessarily require internal direct experience. That could be direct experience here. And that direct experience can be simply the experience of being very conscious and very aware, which can bring you intuitive knowledge about any given situation. An example can be, the Master Samael explains that as we develop these capacities, we may meet a person. And if we're really paying attention and observing ourselves, we may all of a sudden know something about that person. Something that just arises in us, we just simply know. That is intuition. We may even perceive images related to that person. That's clairvoyance. And it may or may not be accompanied by intuition. Yeah, but like a, a gut feeling, you know, you get like a gut feeling or, I mean, do you go by that? Or you, you gotta even dig, dig deeper? You gotta say, no, no, I don't really. That is, it could be a gut feeling, but I yeah. still have to question it. I mean, I Knowing the taste of a gut feeling is very important for everyone to understand. Because we have all kinds of impulses that arise in us. But there is that gut feeling or that hint, that hunch or hint that we feel in our heart. Which can be intuition. It can be the guidance of the being. So knowing what that tastes like is a matter of experience. You simply know it. And there's no other way to characterize it. Any other questions? Okay. What about the mental self-criticism? It doesn't seem to have any real knowledge of the problem or solution, but compares it to previous teachings, dogmas, and experiences. How do we distinguish between that and real objective consciousness? Mental self-criticism is also a tricky thing to manage. It's required in Gnosis that we learn how to be critical of what we feel and think and perceive. Yet at the same time, we have so much pride that that criticism can become a form of abuse or self-recrimination, which is actually very damaging. Learning how to balance that is also a matter of experience. The foundation of Gnostic self-criticism is active, directed attention. And from the point of view of active directed, active, directed attention, there is really a limit on thought. And there is instead the, um, the development of intuitive understanding. So what I'm explaining really is a difference of point of view. When you're observing and receptive to phenomena, Active as a consciousness, but receptive in your perception. There's no room for you to actively beat on yourself. To humiliate yourself. Because if you're thinking bad things about yourself, how can you be actively aware? To be actively aware requires that the mind become passive. Which means... You develop the capacity of not thinking. So this is something that's very difficult to really understand with the intellect. And it's something that we have to understand by experience. Remember that the first step on the road towards achieving the state of Turiya is to develop the capacity of no thought. To not think. But one cannot think and analyze. Just the same as we can perceive without thinking. The consciousness itself is capable of profound analysis, but it is not based on comparing. Comparing is a capacity of intellect. Analysis is not restricted to intellect. Any other questions? Anybody in here have a question? <laughs> we have first choice. Wait. Everybody here is stunned. Go ahead. Is intuition confused with reading another's mind, which the egos apparently can do? How do we tell the difference? 
The egos can be accurate too if it serves their purpose. That is very true. And that's really why we have to be so discriminative in our perception. The ego, each ego, has within it the consciousness itself. And so the ego utilizes the powers of the consciousness for its own ends. That means clairvoyance, or the capacity to perceive things beyond the physical world, is a capacity that the ego also has. That is why we experience things like recurrence, because the egos in us are communicating with egos in another person in order to bring about the reunion of those egotistical elements. The egos in us can read the thoughts and feelings of other people. And that is why we can sense when someone doesn't like us, or we can feel when we're being talked badly about, and we generate resentment or fear or shame. To know the difference between an egotistical perception and a conscious one requires learning how they taste through experience and through meditation. How do you do that from trying to say natural experiences with your own? Pray. You learn how to distinguish between the two in accordance with the guidance you receive from your being. He's the only one that can show you. Because it can be your ego projecting something, or also your own being showing you something. That's right. Learning to, to discriminate between the two is something that we are given by the being. The messages that we receive from the being are, the, are how we learn to discriminate. Because on our own, we're so trapped in subjectivity, we need a force and an intelligence that's superior to the mind in order to guide us. If we rely solely on our own will, we will fail. It's impossible. And so we have to appeal to superior intelligence for that guidance. And the best source of that is our own being. So we're in the face of any perception. We should pray. We should use the techniques and capacities that our being has given us. And that includes learning how to conjure, learning mind, all superior forces in order to assist us. Otherwise, we remain confused. And this is a matter of discrimination. If you say, no, I can do it on my own, that's pride. If you say, no, I understand it very well, that may be pride. Pride is very sneaky. Having confidence in your internal experiences is good, but it's also a trap. You have to know how to have proper confidence. And that proper confidence comes when your own being and your own intimate confirms and delivers to you real intuitive understanding. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions? What do you think it is that actors and actresses, right? You know how they say, oh, I get lost in my, you know, in the character, right? Or character of pride. So you could trigger that, you know, so, so much, you know, on the interview. Oh, yeah, this person, this I is a person that's, you know, has pride and then, you know, envy and comes in. And it could trigger all these egos to come out so strong, but mm -hmm. yet they cannot trigger any, you know, humility or whatever it is, you know, for, for the good of mankind or whatever it is, you know? Actors often, in my point of view, are simply making their own egos very active, suspending their own personality and allowing an ego to demonstrate itself. And that's why they're so convincing. And an ego can look very humble. An ego can look like anything. An ego will parade itself as a saint and as a devil. So many actors, in fact, many um, people that are not actors by profession, but are actors in their daily life, are achieving that end by knowing how to manifest subjective elements in the mind and allowing those elements to project. So they bring up that pride, which has different qualities, and they use that as their personality, which is dangerous because they strengthen it.
To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.